Hi, and welcome to the Deer IQ Podcast, where smart hunting begins. I'm Adam Lewis, and we're in part two of our series, The Great Leverage of Hunters, Deer Science. What we actually know about deer and how they operate directly translates into our hunting decisions and success, which is why this is a super important topic for us to know as much as possible about. In part one, we talked to well-known research scientist Dr. Carl Miller of the University of Georgia Deer Lab about deer vision and how that's different than what we thought. It was a very eye-opening and popular episode with a lot of people, so be sure to go back and listen to that if you haven't, although you don't have to for this episode to make sense. And you're going to want to write some of this knowledge down. There's a lot of wisdom in here to reflect on it afterward, so get our free journal linked below to help with that. Okay, so here are the top things to look for during this episode. Regarding how deer actually perceive smells, what are the quantitative and qualitative differences compared to us humans? Quantitative refers to amounts or quantities, and qualitative are qualities that aren't measurable by numbers. Can you cover up your scent as popular with many hunters and products of cover scent? Can you actually eliminate enough of your scent to make a difference in the woods with scent control. How good is deer hearing really and what does it mean for us hunters and how we treat noises that we make? There's a ton more high IQ science in there as well as Dr. Miller's deer IQ test score being revealed which you're going to want to take the test yourself to compare to his and share it with a buddy too. All right so let's get to the podcast and up your deer IQ. Dr. Miller, we had a previous segment, if you didn't listen to that, we talked a lot about um, deer senses in general, but we also really got into vision and what that means for a hunter. Uh, If you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that for sure. But in this segment, we're going to take a look at uh, the other two senses. We have the sense of smell, we have the sense of hearing, and just understanding those from a deer's perspective again trying to get in a deer's head and dr miller uh worked for you said 35 years at university of georgia doing all this research yeah 34 years but <laughs> we'll round it up uh well you're telling my graduate school kind of my graduate school time it was 40. <laughs> so he has a wealth of information uh about deer in general and so we're going to try to dig into and get into deer's head as we talk about this. Um, so let's start here. Uh, there's a lot of talk out there and has been for years, you know, about a white tail sense of smell and us trying to uh, somehow quantify that, right? And th- this, the old saying of playing the wind uh, that everybody's heard and scent control regiments to help hunters. Um, there are a lot of opinions on these things, right? What, in your opinion, what does the science say about this can a hunter really fool a deer's nose and uh eliminate or at least eliminate it enough that they can fool them let's talk about deer and sense of smell uh well that's a tough question it's kind of, it's kind of yes kind of no <laughs> so let's talk about the sense of smell first in the comparison most hunters think that the difference between a human's ability to smell something and a deer's ability to smell something is just basically an order of magnitude different there are some quantitative differences, there's tremendous quantitative differences, but there's qualitative differences as well. <clears throat> First of all, it's generally assumed that the human has, well, let me think, i remind you how sort of smell works. Air enters into the nose and it goes back to what is called the sensory epithelium, where there are receptor sites, which, which pick up each one of these different chemicals and send it a signal from there to the olfactory part of the brain where it's identified and integrated. Okay, the difference between a human and a deer is that the, the amount of sensory epithelium in a human is very small compared to a deer's, which is, has a lot of folds and there's a tremendous amount of surface area. And the number of receptor sites in the human was at one time was thought to be around 5 million. Some are now the estimates between 10 and 30 million, I think is what the latest estimates of number of receptor sites are. In the deer, the last I saw that really was quantified was back in the 1990s, and they came up with about 300 million. 
Hmm. And actually, there's others that have suggested it may have go, go as high as a billion. So we're talking 10 million versus a billion. You're talking about a hundredfold different in the number of receptor sites. So do deer have a better sense of smell than we do? Well, certainly they do. We all can appreciate that. Most animals do. This thing that God put in front of our face is almost just nothing for holding, except for holding our glasses on, right? <laughs> it's almost non-functional compared to most animals out in the world that live in a chemical environment that we don't. Right. Okay. But the other thing is that, that there's a qualitative difference as well. So for each chemical that's identified or each chemical class, there has to be a specific receptor site for that chemical. So think about what it is that a deer needs to smell. It needs to smell certain things that are associated with food resources and be able to identify those things. It needs to smell certain things as far as uh, social environment, the different glands that they have and so forth and how, what that's communicating. And they need to identify different volatile compounds that are airborne that are identified based on you know, a potential predator and so forth. But there are probably all kinds of chemicals out there that they don't need to know and they may not even have receptor sites for them. So I'm not saying it's true, but it's conceivable that there may be certain compounds that we can smell better than a deer does. It's conceivable. Out of necessity. Yeah, but, but the important thing is that we, de we definitely know that, de that, that deer's ability to smell certain things is orders of magnitudes higher than ours, and that there are certain ones that are very, very important to them. Now, can you cover up a scent? This is the next question. Well, think about what's going on when a deer is walking through the woods and that what it's being bombarded with is this tremendous mixture of all different types of chemicals that are airborne or, so, or on the ground or so forth that they're picking up. All different volatilities, all different, you know, all different types of structures and so forth. They have to be able to sort through those things. Some of those that sorting occurs actually at the receptor site level, like we talked about, they have to have receptor sites for it. And then some of that sorting will be at the olfactory lobe level, where the brain does some of the sorting as well and identifies things that are important and things that are not important. And the response to those things are important. Well, the deer's olfactory lobe is much bigger than our olfactory lobe as well. So they got much more ability to process that type of information. So a deer is being bombarded with all this kind of stuff. Now, let's take for an example. You reach down as a human being, you pick up a handful of duff off the, the ground and you put it in your nose you can smell it right you can smell the leaf litter you can smell the ground and so forth you can't smell a deer track that might have walked across there but a deer could but think of how strong that odor of the ground and the duff must be to a deer as well and they can still sort through that to identify the chemical that was associated with a deer or a predator or something so can you take something and add it to your scent to overwhelm a deer, I think it's probably unlikely. I know mean, you know, there might be certain things that you could conceivably could jam a whole bunch of these receptor sites, but if there's a receptor site open for a particular chemical and that chemical is there, they can do it. Yeah. I spent a lot of time training hunting dogs, coon dogs, and, and blood trailing dogs. And I learned a lot about their ability to, de to track from watching their behavior as well. And a coon dog can take a coon track across a cattle pasture where the cows are out there, or a, cow, or a feedlot, or a plowed field. Whereas all that background scent is really, really strong, right, they can still yeah. identify they that still specific chemical. Up. They can still pick it out. So right. they're selecting out from it is, you know, you can put grapefruit juice or whatever, whatever you want to put on you, they're still going to be able to select out the things that are important. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, I'll just jump in there real quick. Uh, for people listening here so i've compared it before to and i've heard this uh to like soup if we smell soup cooking or a soup that's you know uh, for dinner we kind of just smell soup right we smell it we smell one thing a deer in comparison might be able to select out every single ingredient in different vegetable or meat that's in it and smell them independently type thing is that is that a Decent, decent, decent comparison. You know, there's some time you can smell something to tell what it needs too. You know, so you can you can you can you can tell some of that aroma and, and different things in that in that aroma, but we can't we can't sort like a deer can sort. So you know the, the so the the thing is, is you can't cover a scent because they they are or because of that ability. Now, can you eliminate a scent? 
Um, you know, they, they've done a lot of trials with, with, again, dogs and stuff like that and trying to eliminate human scent. And the dog has absolutely no problem finding, you know, bombs or perpetrators or whatever. They have a tremendous ability. Now, you know, bloodhounds, you know, probably better than a deer, but a deer is not, not that far off. Mm -hmm. So a deer has got a, a tremendous ability to detect scent. So can you eliminate it? No. Can you minimize it? I think that's the important part. You know, minimizing your scent cone can make a difference when you're hunting for a couple of reasons. One of which is if you just go into your deer stand and you smell like you just came out of the gym after an hour, you know, lifting weights and your scent cone that you're projecting is very strong up, up close, of course. Right. But think of how far that scent cone projects as well right. till it gets down to a point where it's, you know, undetectable. So you're just educating deer at the whole at that point as well. Everything downwind of you has smelled you. So minimizing, if you can cut that by, you know, an order of magnitude, sure, they can still smell it when you're, you know, at certain range, but can they, you know, uh, but is they, are you going to educate them further downwind as well? Probably not. Yeah, there's, there's so much out there. And again, a lot of opinions on it. Um, I think about, you know, uh, and, and I do a lot of this, uh, you know, washing clothes, how you store gear in, you know, scent free containers and things like that. Uh, the idea of ozoning things to remove the scent molecules, activated carbon to absorb them, all that stuff. Um, you know, in from my experience, before I did that stuff, I mean, and you have to do it very extremely, very meticulously, right? Um, I got winded a decent amount when I went on hunting. Since I've started doing that, those things, that regimen. I get winded much, much less. And sometimes deer are downwind and they don't do anything right now. Sometimes it's hard to know if they're actually in my cone or not. Sometimes I know they are and they act weird, but they still come right by me type thing. So uh, I've seen a difference and that's the idea of uh, eliminating at least a lot of it um, can, I think, be beneficial. That, that's my perspective. Uh, from yeah, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you. It's one of those things, what is the threshold of detection be before a deer has a response to it? Right, yeah. You know, so if there's a, you know, one molecule per 100 billion or something like that versus 10 molecules per 100 billion, at some mm -hmm. point they're going to smell enough of that that they know you're close enough uh, that, that it's an issue. So that, that was my point is you can't eliminate it, but you can actually reduce it and manage it to some degree. You know, obviously, the most important thing to do is you can completely eliminate the sense of smell from a deer if you're downwind of the deer, mm -hmm. right? If the deer's upwind, there's absolutely no way that deer can detect you. So, you know, hunting wisely, hunting the wind, you know, make the sense that you, that's that's an old adage, but it's it's obviously the most important one. If you, if deer's coming from you from the direction, the same direction the wind, there's absolutely no way that deer can smell you. Right. I think the, the problem comes when you get down to like tactical type stuff is uh, a smart deer isn't going to move in those type of directions if they can uh, avoid it type thing. Um, if they can avoid it. But, you know, most of our country, we have kind of a prevailing westerly wind or something like that. If deer only walk into the wind, they'd all end up in Washington State, you know, at some point. You know, they, they got to go. <laughs> they got to go with the wind or crosswind at some point. Okay, so here's your high IQ moment. So what is your opinion and experience with scent control? Looking at the science and from my experience of hunting for 32 years, I believe they both align. You can and should pay close attention to this area if you want more success on deer. And it's not just the deer you're after that matter, it's all deer. The scent you leave on the ground and on things you touch, as well as your scent cone in the air, all make an impact on deer and educate deer to your presence. Eliminating any trace of your human presence is key to getting cracks at deer and any stink you leave is decreasing this chance and stinking up your area quickly. Not all products work equally though and there is a regimen that does work. This past year I shot a Pope and Young buck on public land in Michigan and I know this was due to this regimen. You can check it out below, I have it linked so you can read through that and apply it. I will say you have to follow it meticulously because if you don't, you will not see results. And that's where most people go wrong. Contact me about that to find out more. 
And here's Dr. Carl Miller's Deer IQ test results. Dr. Miller took this, and the funny thing is that he took it before I made it available to everybody. And he could actually tell me, it's designed to be kind of difficult, right? He could actually tell me where I got this information from. Oh, this study, that study. And he actually corrected me uh, on one of these questions. So he helped make the quiz better, and it is now correct for everybody. But yes, he went above and beyond, and he actually got a 10 out of 10 on the Dear IQ test, which, I mean, I would expect from a doctor, right? Um, but that's what he got. Uh, and I invite everybody to actually go take it and compare yourself to Dr. Miller and how he did. But there's the results. 10 out of 10. So um, I'm sure that's the height of all your accomplishments, right? <laughs> I, I think I finally arrived. <laughs> yeah. You can take the test, link below as well, to compare and share it with a buddy to see how they do. All right, and now let's get back to the podcast and deer hearing. All right, so let's get into then uh, deer hearing and the science behind that. And that's something I've actually personally researched quite a bit and did some testing on. Um, as we look at deer hearing, how is this compared or different to uh, human hearing? And again, what does this mean for hunters as far as gaining an edge, really understanding it? And then, okay, how can I apply this to uh, help my hunting? Right. There's really only been two studies that actually looked at deer hearing. And everything we know is based on those two studies, one of which was done, we did some work actually physiologically, where we actually had uh, implants, where we called an auditory brain stem response, where we could actually get brain readings from different sounds. So the deer's brain would tell us whether it's hearing something or not or responding to something. Uh, about the same time we did that, there was a, a, a father-son team up in Toledo, Hefner and Hefner, who did this study where they trained deer to, to be, produce what is called a behavioral audiogram which when they heard a sound, they would get a response. And I think you worked with them at, to some degree of, of testing some different... Uh, yeah, different hunter sounds uh, after, they did, after they did that study. Yeah. And what's interesting is both the studies found about the same thing, you know, whether it was physiologically or behaviorally, which was, was kind of cool. But remember, one's a physiological, which we're interpreting thing, and the other study was only done with two deer. So, you know, it's, it's you know, all, all of this is based on a little bit of data right now. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more data to be generated on this. But what we know about deer hearing versus human hearing is really it's not that much different. Our peak hearing is on the range of, uh, what is it, two to four uh, kilohertz, and theirs is something like three to five or something like that, three to six, somewhere in that range. Very little difference in, on you know that, that peak hearing frequency. We hear a little bit better into the lower frequencies. They hear a little bit better into the higher frequencies. But the difference out there is in both of those areas, uh, it has to be an extremely loud sound for there to be a very major significant difference in what they hear. So bottom line is, you know, other than the fact that there's a little bit of shift to the right-hand side or the, you know, to, to the upper frequencies, there's not that much difference between a sound entering a deer's ear and sound entering our ears and our ability to detect it. However, there are some caveats associated with that. And one of the which is, you know, deer have these big external ears called pinae, mm. and they have a very important, couple of very important functions for the deer. One of which is to, it's like cupping your hands to your ear. It helps to funnel some of that sound that's coming in there into the ear. So it actually lacks more like a megaphone, which enhances the amount of sound or the, the sound waves coming into the deer which would in naturally enhance their ability to hear if they have their deer ears cupped toward that sound. But if they have their ears cupped towards that sound and there's a sound generated from behind them then, from behind the ears, it would minimize that ability. So hence God gave them the ability to move their ear around back and forth and stuff like that to pick up sounds in front, behind, they, then deer are constantly look, checking sounds sources in all the different directions. And you can learn an awful lot about watching, you know, by watching a deer's ear to hear what think think about what's going on in their mind. The other important thing that these uh, uh, external ears have for for deer is it helps them localize the source of a sound. Yeah. The ability to localize the source of a sound depends on how far the two different sound gathering or the, the, basically the ears are. 
ours are a couple inches apart. If you add the, that distance of the deer's ears, they can get up to you know, 13, 14, 15 inches apart, which is the difference of the, how those sound waves actually hit those ears and are generated into the deer's, deer's ears that allows them the ability to pick out exactly where that noise came from. And then their ability to focus their ears as well. So deer have a tremendous ability. If they hear a sound, they know where that sound came from, particularly if they have their ears cupped towards that. And then they can mm -hmm. shift to their sense of vision to conf confirm what they heard. That's huge. Uh, just with the idea of <laughs> you have to be you have to be really silent as a hunter. And uh, where as humans we have a harder time pinpointing where sounds came from, uh, they are designed to do that very very well. And um, I, I did do some testing with Dr. Hefner that you mentioned. Um, I think his chart, the audiogram, uh, showed that deer heard the best at around 8 kilohertz. Um, and the interesting thing that I found when I did this testing with him, we tested like I think 27 or 28 different what I call hunter noises, like crunching leaves, uh, breaking twigs or branches, um, clanging different metals like tree stands, stuff like that. Um, a lot of these sounds, especially the more natural ones, their peak frequency or highest intensity frequency was around the eight kilohertz. So it means that, you know, noises that hunters typically make walking through the woods or what, what have you, the deer can hear those especially well. Right. And then with their ear, uh, you know, configuration, they can pinpoint exactly where that came from very easily. Right. Um, and so that puts us obviously at a very strong disadvantage. Um, another, I thought this was interesting. Another article that Hefner wrote was talking about how, how the vision and hearing work together. And you just kind of, ref I think, referenced that or uh, referred to that. And this idea, I kind of dummied it down for, for me, but this idea that the you have like a trigger sense and then a uh, confirmation sense, I would call them. So uh, sound might be a trigger sense to a deer. Like if a deer has no clue that a hunter's around, um, but all of a sudden you make a noise accidentally, that's a cue, right? That's a cue to that deer to then, uh, that triggers uh, the, no the next sense, which is eyes to scrutinize, right? Um, and if you can avoid, obviously that first one, you're, you're kind of avoiding the second one by doing that, right? Um, do you have anything to add or, to, I guess, discuss about that idea of, hey, if I can avoid the sense of hearing, uh, the eyes really aren't as maybe a big a deal uh, as as they might have been? Um, a couple of things related to what you said. You know, the study that Hefner and Hefner did, they found, I think it was, it was four to eight was their peak hearing. Yeah. And a lot of people look at those peaks, those the, the valleys on that graph, and they're they're really not that different at the bottom part. And if you looked at the, you know significant differences and stuff like that, essentially they're all about the same. So there's a, there you know that idea of the, the deer hear a little bit better in higher frequencies than we do. Um, it's true, but it's still like I said, we're, we're dealing with two deer, and we did it with a few deer on the physiologies. Anyways, um, this whole idea about the trigger sense, there's no question that one sense triggers another one. You know, you know, um, if, if deer see something, they're going to cut their ears to it as, as well. So they're going to try to employ everything that they can do. They're going to throw all their senses at identifying a potential danger. Um, you know, the deer's ear, they hear something. They're obviously going to try to focus on that, and they're going to take their attention from their eyes to that. That doesn't mean that they, you know, in the absence of hearing something, that their eyes are not being used. There's, they're either still being used just, just as much as they were before. I don't think you can say that if we get rid of the, get over their sense of hearing, they won't ever see us. I think the fact is they, you know, a deaf deer certainly can, can, can identify you as well through the sense of vision. But the idea that one sense triggers the other senses into, into a work, there's absolutely no question that that would happen. I would agree. Yeah. I, I, I guess, think the same thing happens with the sense of smell. You know, they smell something, and deer throws right. up its nose, and all of a sudden it's, it goes into, into motion with its ears, and it goes with, into motion with its eyes, trying to identify, is this really something that you know, I need to be concerned about? Yeah, maybe there's uh, the difference, or a better way to say it would be then they don't go into this hyper-alert 
uh, kind of mode that if a cue would tell them that would trigger them to get hyper alert and start really, you know, scrutinizing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I, I thought about that as well. Um, the idea of, does it, does the, does the sense of hearing require a confirmation from vision or smell? Uh, I think in a lot of cases it does because yeah. they hear something and they're not sure what it is and deer don't want to run off without knowing that there's something that they really need to run off. Right. But yeah. there are certain applications where I think a deer can hear something and it's going to be, it's going to flee. And one of which we mentioned earlier is that two step cadence of a human being that mm -hmm. there is absolutely nothing else like that in the woods. And I think anytime you're walking through the woods with that two step cadence and a deer that has been jumped a number of times by that, they're going to pick up on that two step cadence and doing something as far as interfering with your steps, whether it's stepping on a rock, occasionally a log, or you know, you know, you know, making it sound more like a squirrel. I mean, how many times you've been on a deer stand and you're looking around? You have a deer out in front of you, and you're looking around. You hear something behind you, and you turn around. What is that? And it turns out to be a squirrel. You look here, here's something else. You look over there. It turns out to be a bird. The deer never picked its head up, but as soon as it hears something, you know, as soon as the deer hears something that it knows it needs to be concerned about, whether it's another deer or a human, they instantly are alert because deer know what they're supposed to hear out in the woods and they know what they're not supposed to hear. They live out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? So they're, they're, that's like living in your house. You know what you're supposed to hear in your house or you're driving your truck. You know what your truck is supposed to sound like. And if it makes an unusual noise, you know something's wrong. Now my wife can't do that, but, mm. <laughs> but, but you know, if you if you know what you're not supposed to hear is but something unusual that's a trigger that triggers you to be alert with the other senses as well there's something different yeah something unusual or that shouldn't be there yeah so with all this stuff we've talked about with uh sense of smell sense of hearing uh about deer so what are some things that hunters can uh need to pay attention to and can do maybe differently to try to up their game to try to eliminate some of this this advantage that the deer have regarding these things. Well, I, th I think the, the idea is hunt smart, don't be sloppy, don't teach the deer, and don't overhunt a particular area to where you will teach the deer. I think there's a bunch of you know minimizing some of the things we talked about, you know, as far as your camo, like the blues and, and the shine. You know, one thing we didn't mention as well is the material on a camo, when we're talking about vision, some of that has a sheen on it that has a white flash to it. So, you know, look, sticking to some of the more, you know, the cottons and stuff like that is probably, uh, probably better. Um, minimizing your scent, watching your scent, minimizing your noise. Um, deer, if it's an unusual noise, deer will pick that up. They know what they're supposed to hear out there and metal on metal or, you know, plastic on plastic, all these types of things. Deer can figure that out pretty quickly. And particularly the rustle coming from a jacket, you know, a nylon jacket or something like that. There's nothing like that sound in the woods. Yeah. Just the idea of, yeah, really paying attention to details. Um, one of those soundproofing your gear, things like that. And you mentioned this, and I know you did some uh, work with Sitka as far as uh, all clothes out there. I'll just say this. I'm not endorsing any certain brand or anything, but all clothes that you can get out there isn't equal, right? The, the jacket I, let's say, camo jacket I buy at Walmart or whatever might not be engineered uh, quite as well as some of the other stuff when you talk about, uh, yeah, rustling when you draw your bow, you know, the scraping of your arm against you know, the other material on your chest and what sound that actually makes, how far is that going to travel, right? Deer can pick up those little things, especially when they're closer. And what it's made out of at that point does matter, right? Or could matter if they're that close. And, uh, you know, getting into the physics a little bit, the idea of, uh, and I'll let you talk to this a little more, but six decibels, right? there's physics equations regarding sound and how far they travel right and i think six decibels is the if you can cut something by six decibels you've halved the distance that the sound can travel is that correct okay yeah and it's, well, i think you know this is this is what we actually did working with sick on one of their one of their garments they have up there uh, called the fanatic system 
and they wanted to reduce the amount of noise that they made. So, you know, have a system where you could actually get very close, basically cut the engagement distance, the distance that a deer could hear you if you were doing something normal in a deer stand, whether it's drawing a bow or, you know, opening a pocket or something, that mm -hmm. rustle or, you know, something against a tree, particularly in that four to eight range or, you know, that range where deer hear, hear the best. And basically that's what we did is they developed a fabric up there at, at Sitka and changed it to the point that where we tested the old system versus the new system, we were able to cut the engagement distance or the distance that a deer could hear any of those sounds by half, which is pretty incredible, you know, because right. that, that puts them well within the range of a bow. So it gives you a, a little bit more forgiveness as far as movement and stuff like that. If a deer is a little bit further out, if you got to shift yeah. your, in your stand or something like, like that and get, get prepared for a shot. Yeah. So really paying attention to all, <clears throat> excuse me, all aspects of the hunt, really paying attention to all the little details, whether they be, uh, your scent control type stuff and eliminating as much as you can of your scent, uh, your smell, right, on all your gear, all your clothes, everything. Uh, your paying attention to your camel patterns, right, and uh, the different colors involved there, right, um, and how deer actually see, actually being uh, cognizant of that. And then obviously hearing, right, your, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the, uh, maybe we chat about this a second, but eliminating uh, any noise from your gear, right? Whether it be your tree stand, uh, all your equipment on top of that, your your clothes, being mindful of that, you know, uh, and the noise that they can make in the moment of truth, right? When you're drawing your bow or whatever it might be. And then coming and going, right? Now you mentioned squirrels. I, I personally, I've heard stuff out there where guys are like, oh yeah, uh, change up your cadence somewhere like a squirrel. I've never been able to do that very effectively uh, in the woods because <laughs> squirrels scurry, you know. Um, would there be any tips you'd have as we kind of wrap up this uh, segment here as far as uh, that's a concern, you know, like because I guess the biggest thing I could think of would be just if you can remove the leaves, right? Uh, get rid of the leaves from the path you're traveling if you can because uh, they make noise, right? Is there anything else guys could do regarding that that you can think of? Yeah, you, you know, a lot of times when you're walking through the woods, there'll always be logs and stuff like that or bare spots or something like that. You can step to get just to break up that cadence as well. Kind of interesting, like, this is kind of a side note, and I'm not going to say I recommend doing this every time you go hunting, but when I was working on my PhD way back in the, in the early 80s, I spent an awful lot of time up in the North Georgia mountains running these, these line transects. I'd be out in the woods all day long, every day for the entire winter time, starting right after the, right after the peak of the rut. And there's a lot, most of the time I'd be carrying a staff for a staff compass. And I'd walk through the woods at that time, trying to imitate a deer while I was doing some of this stuff. Instead of that, ch -ch -ch -ch, like a human, more mm -hmm. like that, ch -ch 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 -ch, to sound like, like a deer. And there was three different occasions that I had bucks just come running at me hmm. because they thought they heard another deer. They thought it was another potentially another buck that was traveling through that as a rival or potentially a doe. But they actually came running and I had to, you know, oh, they they said they hung around, you know, because they, they they thought that they were going either going to get into a fight or get something else at, at that point. So, you know, like I said, they learn what they're supposed to hear and what they're not supposed to hear. And that do, those deer knew the sound of a, a potential rival. So you, you took a stick and what was making... That was, the, that was the other deer's leg, you know? Yeah. I was a three-legged deer instead of a four-legged deer. <laughs> well, good stuff, Dr. Miller. Again, appreciate uh, you joining us here today. Uh, I think there's a ton of stuff that guys can extract out of that. So thank you. All right, and now for your high IQ takeaways and challenges. How can you take this deer science about deer smell and hearing and tweak your approaches, your gear setups, your hunting philosophy to better align with reality? If you're getting busted by deer or your locations cool off quickly as season goes by and time goes by, mistakes in these areas are probably the culprits. So what changes are you going to make? Journal about those in our free journal that will really help and also share your thoughts on our private Facebook community of like-minded hunters, both linked below. 
and make sure to sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss any of our great high IQ content, including our YouTube videos as well. Check those out on our YouTube channel. And next time we continue Dear Science with Dr. Bronson Strickland and talk about specific studies on collared bucks. Is it what we've thought about deer in movements, bedding, and the use of land really true? There's some really high IQ stuff there. You won't want to miss it. And I'll see you then.